ALG really saved me. I put all of my success on joining this group. People constantly checking in saved me. I made so many like friends with people that I've never met, but I feel incredibly close to and, and I consider them family. It really is a family. It is a place where you can just be yourself and there is no judgment. There is no shame. You are so welcome there. Nobody has to be in this alone. Everybody is either going through or has gone through the same thing at one point. Let's do this. Welcome back to the ALG podcast. If you're listening to this on the day of drop, then happy Friday to you. Really quick at the top of the show, if you guys could five-star rate and review the show, those five-star rate and reviews go a long way, and we love to read those reviews, so keep them coming. Guys, happy Friday. We have a really special show today, but really quick. The show is sponsored by Redcon One. For the highest state of readiness, go to redcon.com, redcon1.com. Use promo code T20JARPS to save 20% off your entire order. And that's the best way that you can support the podcast. So let's go. Let's get ready for the show. As always, I am John Arpino, otherwise known as JARP's Journey on Instagram. I am joined alongside my partner in crime, David Roden, otherwise known as Fit underscore D Rock. And today, our special guest is None other than Zach Cohen, Instagram and TikTok connoisseur. <laughs> Zach, what's going on, brother? How's everything doing? I don't know if I'd go that far, but you know. <laughs> I, I love it because like, so so preface, because this is how this works for anyone who knows the show very well. This is how this works. We got we got we got John. John is like, just tell me what to do. Let's talk like and I'll just do it. And I'm the science guy. And I'm like, how do things work? And, I and like, shoot. and yeah, John just is like, okay, someone who's successful, just tell me what to do. And I'm like, well, <laughs> tell me why I want to know why. So it's gonna be really fun. Cause I was super excited to get Zach on here. Cause I'm like, I'm, I'm super excited for nutrition, education, science stuff. And I know what's really cool with you is you sit down the middle and that's what I vibed a lot with, um, with what you do and in, in being a nutritionist and everything. And just you have a good education, but you're not crazy with it. You, right. you keep things yeah. very simple. Um, so first and foremost, kind of tell me your backstory and like where you, where you came from and uh, where you're at now and how you got there. Um, so I actually did a, uh, a career change in my mid thirties. Um, really? I was military, military all my life. I military. For, nice. Well, yeah, I appreciate Yeah. I was about to say, I appreciate your sacrifice and your service first and foremost. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I left for the military at 18, did six years, and then I got out. Um, and then I went back as a contractor and I worked as a contractor in the middle East for five, six years. Wow. No shit. Um, in between there, I had a, a bout with cancer. I don't know if I have ever no. mentioned that on any of my, yeah. Wow. So I, um, I was diagnosed with bone cancer in 2007. Oh, um, I fought that for two years, um, beat it. And I've been in remission for a little over 10 years now. Wow. Dude, dude God bless you. Yeah. I lost my grandma to yeah. bone cancer. So God bless you. That's yeah, awesome, it's, it's tough, man. Yeah, for sure. A lot of surgeries, uh, fake hip, uh, half my half my lung removed. Yeah, so it was damn. It was rough, but you know, it, it taught me a lot. Um, and I think that's what really kind of sparked the interest in nutrition. Um, right. Just because it, it goes a long way, just, you know, preventative maintenance, taking care of your body, making sure you know, you prioritize your health. Um, you know, I think a lot of people we suffer from that Superman syndrome where we think that nothing can ever happen to us until it does. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. So, um, but uh, yeah, when I came back from uh, contracting, I uh, worked at a gym, you know, in and out as a personal trainer. And I realized that fitness was, you know, it's obviously important, but without the nutrition aspect of it, I mean, you're, you're running nothing. in circles, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. You, you know, you see people slaying themselves on the treadmill at the gym for two hours a day, not getting anywhere because they don't have their diet in order. Yeah. They go it, home it and eat a Jets pizza. Right. Yeah. But I, yeah, but I thought if I just ran for an hour, I can basically yeah. eat what I want and, and you lure his body. That's what I've been told. Yeah. If I do yeah. crunches, I get abs. That's how the, that's yeah. what the fitness TikTokers tell me. Like, <laughs> so actually yeah, really quick what was your nutrition like before going through all of this like i understand ex uh, you know ex-military guy obviously your nutrition had to be 
pretty good to be in the military, but like, yeah. did you have any vices as far as food goes or anything like that? Uh, not particularly. I, um, I always ate pretty well. I thought, um, right. You know, I, I was always, you know, in the gym trying to get as big as I, you know, I, I could be, um, when I was diagnosed with, uh, cancer, I was actually at my biggest, I was 220 pounds and I was wanting to like train to like step on stage and do like, oh, really? a show. So it, it really hit me. Like I, I literally thought I was Superman, like nothing could stop me, you know, like I, I was the strongest I had ever been squatting over 500 pounds. And then it, it hit me. I, I had some pain in my hip. Um, I was in Iraq at the time and uh, I went to the doctor and, you know, military doctors. I don't know if you guys know anything about them. But they're not the greatest at <laughs> yeah, you know, diagnosing. Yep. So uh, she asked me, she said, um, you know, well, does your hip ever pop? And I was like, yeah, sure. She was like, oh, you have snapping hip syndrome. I'm like, ah, the old okay, snapping I don't hip. Know. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't know what that is, but sure. So, you know, long story short, a couple months went by, pain was getting worse. I ended up going to Germany, get a biopsy um, or a, a CT scan, MRI. Yep. And um, they were like, yeah, we see something there. You need to go to the States and get this biopsy. So flew to the States. They did two wow. biopsies and sure enough. Yeah. But uh, yeah, my nutrition, I mean, I, I thought it was good. You know, you, you eat whatever is at the defect. Um, you know, right. you don't really have a whole lot of freedom. Uh, especially in the Middle East, you eat what what they have, but it's a lot of, you know, chicken and rice and veggies and stuff. That's always an interesting one. Like, and that, that this is the hardest question. I mean, you can't even answer. It's like, did do, that's always the ba- the balance of Western medicine, Eastern medicine, kind of where it's like, do you think your nutrition influenced that? And it's like, what are your thoughts? Probably not. Or what? Uh, no. So uh, actually, there's been uh, some investigations done. So I I deployed. I was part of a combat comm unit in the Air Force, and so we would deploy uh, to like combat zones, and we would set up the communications. So we we would have a saying where the first ones in, last ones out, because we're the comm. You know, we had to go set up everything for you know the mission to take place. Right. So in 2003, when the war kicked off you know, after September 11th, which is crazy. We just hit the 20 yep. year anniversary. of That's it. wild. Um, but uh, in 2003, I deployed to uh, Northern, uh, Northern Iraq. And so there was no, there was no trash system. There was no plumbing. There's nothing. So we would have to burn our feces. Wow. Uh, we would, we had burn pits. We would burn styrofoam batteries, oh like all gosh. this like craziness. Right. And then not on, on, on top of that, when the Iraqis pulled out, when we invaded, they set fire to all of the oil fields. Yep. So we couldn't use it. So we were literally breathing that stuff in 24 seven. We were in the middle of it, mm. living in bombed out buildings, breathing that stuff in, burning our, burning our feces with diesel fuel, breathing all that stuff in. And actually there's been a, a huge rise of <clears throat> cancer cases from people from that were deployed that makes in that in that time zone so wow. that makes sense wow yeah. that's 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 unbelievable unbelievable yeah. that's insane <laughs> but you know it just goes to show that you know it's not just about nutrition there's so many other things that play yep. a part in our health you know, it's environmental environmental is a huge part of you know yeah our overall health i think i think it comes down to nature and nurture it's it yeah to, across it the that. board yeah it's it's like it's like my uh, i, I want to i'm probably gonna make a tiktok on this too it's like like from the obesity perspective and, and like I, I i always you get this group of people that are and i understand it because you want to make yourself feel better um but this like body positivity and it's leaning on almost promoting obesity right and yeah. i say in that situation it's like there isn't a organ system in your body that isn't hurt and stressed from being obese like your yeah. skin your heart, your lungs, your lymphatic system, there is respiratory system. Everything is stressed from being in an obese yeah. state. And so like that that whole thing. And so you go to you go to the the same thing there. It's like thinking about all the different variables that come into play of living the healthiest and most effective way you can. So then you come back from the war, you get you you you're in this hybrid space, you figured out that Working in the gym wasn't necessarily the spot. You get into nutrition. How was that sequence? What, did, you, did you go back to school for it or all that kind of stuff? Yeah. So uh, I was going through a, <clears throat> a nasty divorce at the time. And I met 
uh, this cute girl at the gym that I was working at. Classic. And uh, it, we hit it off and we started getting serious and I found out she was going to school for dietetics. I was actually walking towards the line of going to school for culinary because I love to cook. Oh, nice. And so she ended up convincing me to go to dietetics and I start going to the same school. She's my wife now. So nice. uh, <laughs> yeah, so we spent uh, the next four years in, in college together and we've kind of built our brand off of that, you know, our and life how, how old are you at this point? Uh, let me see, I'm 39 now. I was 30, 32, 33, something like that when I started. Okay. Yeah. Very dope. So yeah, it was scary, you know, being in your 30s and doing a, a drastic career change, going from the IT side of the military into, you know, the transitioning from military to c- civilian sector yeah, has alone is scary. Yeah. You know, it's and correct me you know, if I'm wrong, a lot but of guys that don't know oh, how to do it. No, hundred percent. And then nutrition in particular tends correct me if I'm wrong. It tends to be more of a female base. Yeah. Like when, like you, you, you're in your classes, I bet you all, most of your classes are 80% women. Yep. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. There was only in my class, it was only me and one other guy. And then the, uh, the class behind me was one guy. Uh, and the class behind him was one guy. Yeah. So how did you so, realize that you were falling in love with it though? Um, like at, when I started going to school. Yeah. Like when you really got into the nitty gritty of dietetics and whatnot. Um, honestly, the, the challenge of it, um, just because I realized that as much as I thought I knew about nutrition, I didn't know shit. Yeah. Like I had to unlearn so much bro science. Oh, it's, it's, it's ruthless. Yeah. It was insane. I'm like, All right, but, tell me some of your favorites. Like you're, you're but, in class, but, but Jay Cutler said, <laughs> Jay Cutler said, all right, tell me, tell me some of your favorites. What are some of the biggest, bro? Like you were, you were truly almost offended when you found out that that wasn't true. <laughs> um, honestly, the anabolic window. Oh, oh that was, yeah, that was a big one for me, man. I'm like, do you know how many times I've like got pissed at myself for leaving my my shake at home and like thinking <laughs> that all my all my gains are gone? Oh my god! And for anyone who doesn't understand anabolic window, it means like 30 minutes after a workout, if you don't get at least this amount of protein in your workout was a waste of time right or how yeah. supposedly there's like 20 minutes where you could eat wherever you want after a workout and it's just gonna go right to the muscle <laughs> that's my favorite bro we can yeah. we can go to taco bell right now we could go right now but if we leave in the next five minutes we can't go anywhere we got three and a half minutes yeah. to get this this cheesecake down or it goes on as fat <laughs> <laughs> yeah that one and i would probably say um uh Oh, I got to load up on carbs after my workout, replenish my glycogen. Yes. Like you, you didn't slay yourself that hard. Like you didn't run a marathon. You, your glycogen is fine. It's just fine. Yeah, that one's always so funny to me too. Is like the, <laughs> the people out there, it's like, oh yeah, my glycogen storage is a wear down. I'm like, you don't understand how much is in your liver or how much like you have a ridiculous amount of storage. <laughs> and, you know, honestly, I, I think that's, that's what's really hard for me to, differentiate in the world of nutrition right there's Mm -hmm. there's the basics and then and then there's the nuances and i feel like people focus way too much on the nuances so yes it's like it's like filling a jar right you fill a jar with small pebbles first and then the big pebbles you're not going to get as much in there if if you put the pebbles first and then the sand you know you worry about getting adequate sleep stressing less eating as much whole foods as you can, hydrating, stuff like that. Right. People are more so focused on detoxes, yep. uh, fat burners, um, all these like little things, meal timing, like meal timing should be the last thing you're worried about if you don't mm-hmm. have everything else in order first. Absolutely. Exactly, exactly. Because yeah, that one's always so funny to me. It's like, it's the same thing when it comes to nutrition and fitness across, or it's like hit training. Hit training people annoy me because it's like yeah there is this subtle science of like yeah there's an afterburn associated to hit training but guess yeah. what if you if you loathe hit training with a passion and you only do it once a week who wins the person who walks 20 minutes a day every single day or the person who does hit training once a week because they hate yeah. it but they'll do it once a week guess what the person who walks 20 minutes a day is burning way more calories than the yeah. person who does hit training once yeah. a week yeah and, you, and you know what I it think is it really Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, as a society, we draw more towards rumor and innuendo 
than we do actual facts because it's just rumor and innuendo is everywhere. You know, enough people say the same thing over and over and over again, whether it's on social media or in real life, we're all going to gravitate towards that rather than actually sitting down, you know, I hate the word fact checking, but fact checking all the science and whatnot, like we don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. Not at all, but we'd rather follow someone with 100,000 followers or so, and they tell us, okay, if you drink this four times a day, you're going to shit, and it's just going to be, everything's going to be great. Like, now you're down 20 pounds at the end of the week. So kind of going off of that, because I love your base of it it all, what is, when, when you, from your knowledge, your experience, what are the boulders, what is the sand, and what is the water of, like, a base of nutrition? What kind of break that down. So... For me, I just, I think it really comes down to lifestyle changes, right? Yep. And you, you've heard it before, but I think the reason that fad diets and diet culture and the supplement industry and stuff like that, they make so much money and it's so popular is because people have a hard time accepting the fact that they are completely in control yes. yep. of everything, yep. right? Everybody wants to hear on the news one day that, you know, you had no control over becoming obese. It was something that the government was putting in our water that made yep. us obese. Yep. You Some know, genetic told us that, Yeah. Nobody told us that carbs were making us fat. So we look for somebody to blame besides ourselves. Mm-hmm. you know? And I think uh, taking, taking accountability for that goes a long way, creating Huge. that awareness. And honestly, nobody wants to hear that getting adequate sleep, adequate hydration, being more active, focusing on whole foods, limiting the ultra processed foods. That's really what health in a box is, right? Mm-hmm. But it's not fancy. It doesn't sell. It's, it doesn't come in a bottle. Right. So nobody wants it. Yeah. You know, no one wants to hear the hard truth. No, it's, it's funny. Cause like the, number one, the first thing you said wasn't even nutrition advice. Yeah. Like it's like accountability for the the daily habits and rituals you have for yourself like that and and being assertive on the idea that I am in control. This is I, what goes in my mouth with how I use my body. These are things I control. It's not, I'm not victim to this idea that there's some mystic thing that's holding the, the weight and health in, in check for the majority for the majority. Yeah. Obviously, we, we had a, a I don't know if you had if you've ever heard of her, we had a, a guest on who has lipolymphedema. And she okay. has a true genetic disorder where her lymph system uh, basically manipulates with fat and it creates a third type of fat that is super difficult. You can't lose it doing to, movement to burn. Or like that. Yeah. And so yeah. yeah, there is that population out there. And I'm, I'm the first one to say, let's look at all we can. But then we got to flip the coin here and go, that may be true, but that's not you. <laughs> right. And th- and th- those are the outliers, you know, exactly. and it, it, we always have to be careful, especially with social media. We're talking to the majority of the population. Mm-hmm. You know, there's always going to be somebody that out there with PCOS, uh, PMDD, like, you know, situations like that. Absolutely. Immunocompromised, all these different ailments and stuff that, you know, plague them, but they're the outliers. Mm-hmm. But I think that the majority of the population, they, they want something like that too. Mm-hmm. They want something to cling on to as so, well. Something. Yeah. It's not my fault. It's not my, fault. yeah, it's I not just, me. Nope. I just have an addiction to sugar. Yeah. It's like it's sugar. my fault. It's a predisposition. Yeah. 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 yeah and exactly. I was born that way. Yeah. And so that's, that's a, that's, a, I love that, that foundation. And then um, the lifestyle change of eating more whole based foods, staying away from the super processed, um outside so that would that would be like your your boulders that's like your 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 foundation yeah for sure and i'm a i'm a huge advocate for the 80 20 rule okay you know focus 80 percent on the foods that you know Mm -hmm. whole grains fiber uh water content uh, you know whole foods cook it at home so you know you know what you're getting how many calories and then that other 20 percent is the fast food the restaurants the chips the soda, the, you know, whatever else it really is. Everything comes down to the dose makes the poison, Mm -hmm. you know, and I try to walk this fine line. You kind of touched on it a few minutes ago of the whole, so there, the haze culture, the health at every size. Yep. Um, So I try to walk that line, right. I I actually made a shirt. It says uh, 
pro health or uh, pro diet, anti diet, and they're both crossed out. And then under it, it's pro health. Mm-hmm. Cause I'm not, I'm not pro diet and I'm not anti diet. Right. I think there's a place for it. Not everybody should be, you know, forced to lose weight if, if they are healthy and they're fine, but they also need to realize that a specific amount of weight can cause problems. Yes. Yep. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and on the flip side of the coin, now I feel like the anti diet culture is almost becoming shameful towards the ones that are dieting and trying yep. to lose weight. Yep. You know, it's like we live in this zealot society where everything 100%. is either black and white. And yeah, we there's, live in the gray. No happy you know, middle. there's zero happy yeah. middle. You know, um, I like to tell people uh, because I'm very, I don't like to, I don't like the phrase diet. You know, I feel like diet, at least on my side of the fence, creates a notion that this is going to have a beginning and it's going to have an end. And when you put yeah. something like that on the table, nobody, you know, everyone's going to white knuckle it. And then once the end comes, then, you know, we're back to the old habits. So what I like to tell people is it's lifestyle. When, once you, once you replace that word diet with what's your lifestyle going to be, I think so many more doors open as far as nutrition, as far as life, you know, life itself goes um, and the way that you operate in the gym, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, I like to use the phrase anti-diet diet club, you know, like I want everyone to be happy with who they are, but like you just stated before, there has to be a line where you say, okay, you're happy at your size and that's great. But is that, is that affecting your life in other areas that you don't realize? Right. You know what I mean? So yeah, I'm, it's I'm funny that the, you said that. The word diet. Uh, so in, in school for dietetics, they, the textbooks never define diet as, you know, the media portrays it. Diet literally means the foods we eat and drink. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. That's what diet means. Diet culture, the supplement industry, media, they've hijacked the word to where now it's accepted as exactly what you just said. It's something right. that is is temporary and it's going to end. Right. Right. <clears throat> and how do we as a society get away from that is the question. <sighs> it's hard, <laughs> man. It, I'm, you know, it. it's really frustrating for me. Um, so I, I took the plunge and started a TikTok at the beginning of this year. Okay, tell, tell me this story. Okay, go into the details because th- preface this with, with, this being, uh, with this being Zach's first uh, podcast. I, when, I, when I reached out to him, like, I vibed with you heavy because you, you play the 90% game, which I love. It's like it, you, you, you kind of play that, that hey, let's, let's talk about the basics here and talk about, hey, meal prep and you can make it cheap and all that yeah but but when i reached out you were like uh i'm actually like an introvert at heart man like i don't know if i could do a (laughs) podcast i'm like you have seven hundred and fifty thousand followers in tiktok don't give me the shit that you're an introvert but i was i was so excited to kind of walk that line of how that became to be it's like go go more into detail to that yeah i actually uh i told one of my clients today i was talking to him he he chats me up all the time and i told him i said i'm actually doing my first podcast today you know, I was talking to him. And he was like, yeah, I can tell you're an introvert in your videos. I was like, wait, what is that supposed to mean? You can tell. <laughs> He's like, it's not a bad thing. It's kind of the appeal. You know, I think people kind of relate to it. Yeah, because um, you're not so like yeah, marketing. So, yeah. Uh, but uh, for a couple of years after I graduated, I tried to, uh, my wife and I, we started our own LLC. We took that plunge. Um, and uh, we were trying to market ourselves on Instagram. Right. And my Instagram, what I would spend, you know, three, four hours on an infograph, you know, putting it all together from, you know, bare bones, citing research and stuff like that. I would spend four hours on it and get 15 likes. Yep. Yeah. Like, this, this is such a waste of time. And uh, my my niece, actually, she was huge on TikTok. Like she loves it. She would always be playing videos and stuff. And I noticed that there was actually uh, a market for like advertising yourself on there. It's not just dancing and you mm-hmm. know, comedy. So I was like, you know what, I'll, I'll try it out. And um, my first video that went viral um, was uh, my cancer story. I did a quick little snippet of, of my cancer history and how, you know, before and after or whatever. And it kind of blew up. And then um, I honestly don't know how my nutrition started to take off. But uh, yeah, I mean, at the beginning of the year, I, I, I took that dive and here I am now. And I 
we were leaving the uh, the grocery store uh, about a month ago, and I was talking to my wife, and I was like, you know what? So I'm I'm the bargain shopper. When we go in, and I I say, okay, we need mayonnaise, and she grabs it, and I'm like, wait, did you notice this other mayonnaise is three cents cheaper? I'm gonna swap that out. <laughs> you know, so I'm I'm that guy. You know, I come from you know a a, a poor you know upbringing. Um, my mom she raised me and all my brothers and sisters on her own for a long time, and um, you know, so I'm still that, you know, kind of bargain shopper. And I was like, you know what? People need to realize that eating nutritious foods doesn't have to be expensive. And mm-hmm. yes, I think that's a big misconception. People are like, oh yeah, I, I can't eat healthy. It's too expensive. No, no, because you have to eat GMO free organic yep, right. and organic. organic is really expensive. <laughs> it's called yeah, marketing. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yep. Absolutely. What, uh, how has that experience been like, especially because, because I, if you're going into the, into the trying to make foods uh, accessible, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm the first one to agree, like there are populations out there, like in these cities that have food deserts, and they're a real thing, and we got to fix that yeah. kind of stuff. Uh, yeah. But GMOs is, is becoming the new Vogue, anti-Vogue. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so when you are creating these healthier alternatives and learning how to meal prep and GMO is in it, how is that sequence for you? Uh, I honestly don't pay attention to it because you don't pay attention. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I know it's safe. I know it's extremely, extremely researched. Yep. Um, you know, and, and people, like, I've, I've talked to people where they're just so ignorant to the topic. They'll say something like, Oh, that food is sprayed with GMO. Yeah. Do you don't even know what GMO means? GMO, like what, what does that mean? Like, are you confusing GMO with pesticides or right. like they just hear these trigger words and they just throw mm-hmm. it out. It's almost like they regurgitate everything that they hear. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, mind you, I always, pre- I always preface this. I don't like Monsanto's. I think they're an awful business. They've done some nasty things, obviously round up and hiding the carcinogenic yeah. effect, all this kind of stuff there. That is a real thing. But just right. because one company does one thing that's really bad, doesn't mean that. Yeah everything is bad. <laughs> right. And I think people have kind of lost hope in our government, yes. our, mm-hmm. our, you know, our institutions. Every that institution. Are, yeah. are the set, FDA, you know, the everything. FDA, the USDA. Yeah, exactly. And I think people are now so reluctant to trust in them that there's, they cling on to the first YouTube conspiracy video that yeah. they see. That There's too know, much media. And, yeah. That's all it is. It's way too much media. It's all saturated. And you'll 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 Google something, and if you just change one keyword around, you'll get a whole different answer. You know? What <laughs> Did I mean? you see that? Did you see that TikTok that went viral? Yeah. The, oh, the one you I, showed. I yeah, sent yeah, it to yeah, you. Yeah. So it's this guy. He goes. He goes, guys. I, I understand why everyone's stressed and and freaking out because because we live in a day and age where you can literally Google and reaffirm in clinical studies whatever you want. Yep. See what? And he's like, I'm in right now. I'm in line to get a cup of coffee. And I bet you if I Google, there's going to be clinical research on how a cup of coffee causes blindness. And he Googles it. And he goes, see, it can, it can, it can contribute to glaucoma. And yeah. he goes, but then I can Google search on how coffee doesn't cause blindness and helps your eyes. And he Googles, Coffee helps your eyes. See, caffeine can lower your chance of getting uh, blank eye disease, degenerative eye disease. See, at the same time, I'm drinking my cup of coffee and I'm trying to figure out if it's going to cause blindness or save my eyesight. And I don't freaking know. And you wonder why I'm stressed out about life. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I thought it was such a funny video. And, and it's so true. But honestly, if you, if you really think about it, that should give you hope. Mm-hmm. that that our institutions are studying these things right. so extensively that yeah there's going to be some things that you know kind of look like it could mean something but that's where the whole correlation doesn't you know necessarily you have to know where to ride the you know. line you know yeah and, so, and sometimes absolutely. you have to be on both sides of the line mm-hmm. that's what i always go back to and i always try to look at the macro picture it's like okay it's like for example vegan um it's like there are some good foundational things we can talk about with with, with the vegan lifestyle and being more plant-based and you can there's certain things you can you can take away from that but then there are leaps where then it turns into well basically meat in this is causing your death and it's and i'm like okay then show me consistently 110 year old vegans show me consistently that they can live to 110 oh you can't Mm -hmm. they still get heart disease they still get these things so don't give me this shit that like, it doesn't happen. Yes, it does. Like that, like now it can play influence, but show me vegans that live consistently enough and flip the coin carnivores. Like yeah. 
show me consistently 110 year old carnivores. It doesn't happen. And you know, honestly, I I think I think one of the best things that our population could do is teach extensively how to read research in like mm -hmm. high school. So that's something. So that was something that I learned in in college. Like I was one of those guys that I would Google it, and if I found a website that affirmed my you know opinion or my belief, I'm like, there it yes. is, right there. Carbs right. are bad. Black, black and white. <laughs> Google said it. Yep, Google said so, and yep. I think that's one of the the biggest hurdles that we that we face in society nowadays. The the, the misinformation machine just yeah. keeps churning, you know, just because most people don't know how to read research. They don't know about PubMed. They don't know about Google Scholar. They don't know about, mm -hmm. you know, peer reviewed. And then on the flip side, you have the people that say, well, who's paying for this research? You know, they, they have a, you know, a vested interest. And I'm like, you know. That's actually a hard one. So like I had that conversation with my dad because uh, my dad's an interventional cardiologist. And so, which is hysterical in and of itself, I always bring up like four, I was 410 pounds at 18 years old and your dad's a heart doctor is just kind of comical. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I always go back to, and I understand this argument because like, you know, Sean Baker, he's, he's a, uh, carnivore, he's a carnivore doctor. Like he, he really supports carnivore lifestyle. Um, mm -hmm. but the one thing I respect about him compared to like, uh, carnivore MD, carnivore MD has gone into a freaking cult following and it's, it's, and now he's selling supplements more than he's telling about the lifestyle, but like Sean Baker, for example, he is in the process of getting clinical research done on the carnivore lifestyle. But guess what? The only way you're getting that money is through some private enterprise because right. like pharma is not going to pay for it. Um, yeah. There are entities that aren't going to pay for it. So you're going to have to find other means to get that money together to create a clinical study to find out what this means. And there is that, that is the tough part within nutrition is there is some semblance of frustration when it comes to when there are Vogue diets, they can't get yeah. money to research it because mm -hmm. who, who's going to pay for it? And like, that's, that's been the interesting one as of late that I do understand. Now it doesn't yeah. mean conspiracy theory, but it's crazy to think that like big pharma, I'm not a huge fan of, I'm, 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 I'm yeah, to be honest here, because uh, it's like, because for example, big pharma doesn't have to po have to uh, publish negative reviews, like mm -hmm. neg negative studies. Like, think about that. It's like I don't. Un that seems a little conflict of interest that they can create clinical studies, and the fact that if the data doesn't affirm their their whatever pharma pharmaceutical, they can just not publish it. And right. it's like, yeah. how is that legal? Like, I feel like you, you should be forced to publish any trials. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's where it comes down to replicated research, you know, just mm -hmm. because you see three research papers that come out, you need to look for six or nine or 12, you know, like find that replicated research. You, you can't just cherry pick the things that you want to relay and just ignore the the vast majority of the research that's done in the field. But, you know, everything starts somewhere, you know, and like the carnivore diet, it's, you know, fairly new. So there's probably not going to be a lot of replicated research. There's not going to be a lot of, you know, extensive long-term studies done. You know, it, it's like the ketogenic diet, it's been around for a long time, but they're finally getting into kind of researching longer term ketogenic diets. Yep. You know. Yeah, instead of just being for anti seizural and this, it's like, okay, yeah, what right. is the actual lifestyle? Like, how does it how does it deal with heart Keto's disease? Keto's very how sexy does... right now. Keto's yeah, very sexy. Everybody and, loves it. Yeah. And it's and it's funny to me because like I lean towards a lower carbohydrate diet, not zero, Same. but lower right. carbohydrate, just because of how I've how I've experienced life and seven years of sustainability. That's just the way I've leaned, and it seemed to be the easiest for me. I'm not zero, but I'm not 400. There's people out there that take 400 to 600 grams of carbs a day, and I'm like, how the fuck do you do that? Yeah. yeah. Um. And so, but the the where was I going with this? Dang it. Um. Balls. Land your plane, bud. I Land the plane. It's gone. I, I hold on. Find it. We're talking about lower carb diets. Um. It's gone. Damn it. Yeah, right, and I just chop that whole part out. I think honestly, it just really comes down to sustainability. I always tell mm -hmm. I always tell my clients up front that the only macro I want you to track is protein. 
Yes. That's only macro Thank you. Track. Yep. I Carbs love that. and fats. Research has shown time and time and time and time again that they're very interchangeable. Mm-hmm. I would never ask somebody that loves steak and eggs to do low fat, just like I would never ask somebody that loves pasta and bread to do low carb. Yeah. You know, you have to find something that's sustainable for you. And it comes back to lifestyle change. You know, if you do something that you absolutely hate, it's not going to be long term. It's not going to be sustainable. You know, you're going to fall right into that yo-yo dieting. You know, New Year's is is right around the corner. I expect business to start booming, you know, on January 1st. And, you know, if there's one thing I've really learned. So my wife, she went on to uh, bypass the whole registered dietitian thing. She works with eating disorders. Okay. She went on to get her master's in behavioral health, uh, behavioral analysis. So she's a, a, a behavioral therapist now, and she coaches more so behavioral change. Yep. Okay. Finding really connecting with your emotions surrounding those moments of, you know, binge eating, mm-hmm. uh, those moments of purging, those moments of restricting. You know, why are you doing this? Trying to connect the mind to the body, Yep. you know, so a lot of it really comes down to an emotional and mental aspect of it. Yes. No, I completely agree. That's, that's a lot of what I do in the the coaching side myself is like trying to break those negative belief systems, Mm -hmm. trying to break, like at the end of the day, I'm I'm a firm believer of everything we, first off, everything we do, we do intently for positive intent. Like you're eating a bunch of food to make yourself feel full. What is that reason? Like you're right. doing it for a reason. And like, at the end of the day, everything you do is either benefiting your life is neutral for your life or is hurting your life. And it's like, yeah. let's take those things that are that are habits that you have that are negative, And let's try to find something that will fill that void of negative because you're doing it for a reason in a more yeah. positive way. It's like, okay, you, you deal with, you use food as your stress management tool. Okay. I understand it because you you eat full, makes you breathe, makes you relax. Okay, what can we do that will help you deal with stress better that doesn't involve binge eating a bunch of food? Okay, working out, uh, whatever it may be. Let's find a different strategy. Yeah, finding those replacement behaviors. Exactly, exactly. That's a lot of what I, I work on. I think, I think absolutely no matter what, there's going to be a lot of emotion behind food, whether Mm -hmm. it's good or bad. We just, there's always a connection that's bigger than food that lies behind it, you know? And, and that's, and that's like the real barrier that people have to break when they're trying to change their life. Like me, for example, you know, I had, when I was 510 pounds and growing up, I, you know, I grew up a, a obese kid my whole entire life. I had an emotional attachment to pizza. You know, pizza, I didn't look as a food. Pizza to me was a security blanket. When I was upset, pizza was there. When I was mad, pizza was there. Like pizza never told me that I was fat, ugly, stupid, et cetera, et cetera. But when I changed my life, you know, I had to cut pizza out because not because pizza was necessarily bad for me, but because I didn't need that security blanket anymore. Like I had to, I had to learn how to live life without that blanket around me. You know, so like that's where people need to, you know, find that again, going back to finding that line and, and staying on what side of the line you want to be on or just riding the line in general, you know. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to ask you also, you know, we have a lot of listeners, obviously, who listen to this podcast who are in a space where they are, you know, trying to change up their eating, st- their eating habits, they're trying to change their lifestyle. And they're trying to do it, like we said earlier, in a reasonably priced range. So like, what are some tips that you give these people when it comes to going into a grocery store and trying to pick out better options for themselves? Um, you know, I think uh, there's this big misconception that so if you ever walk into a grocery store, a lot of the, the frozen foods, they're actually pretty expensive when you go and compare it to a five pound pack of chicken. Right. Mm -hmm. So you can get a five pound pack of chicken that will last a week plus if it's just you for 10 bucks, at least at my Walmart. I don't know what prices are everywhere else, but right now I think chicken at Walmart, it it was almost always a dollar 99 a pound. It just went up to 208 a pound. I don't know what happened, but yeah, (laughs) exactly. But um, yeah. So if you go in and you try to find foods that I, I really don't think it comes down to price anymore. I think right. it comes down to convenience right. mm-hmm. and people want those convenience foods. They want something they could just throw in the microwave. And that's why no. I think that one of the, 
biggest things you can do to start your journey is commit to meal prepping. I think meal prepping goes so far in your journey. Like even if it helps create that awareness up front that, okay, these are the foods I can eat. I saw results. These are the changes I need to make. I need to have a plan, you know, kind of steering away from those convenience foods. Um, I, I think goes a long way. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm, I'm, that, that's, that's one of the things I always enjoyed about your too, is like the fact of like meal prepping is such a, when you look, when you get into the habit of meal prepping and you just, you cook up three, four days of food on a Sunday or a week of food on Sunday. Yeah. yeah you, you have two so and a half convenient. hours. It's so convenient. So convenient. And microwave yeah. chicken tastes just as good as when you first <laughs> had it. Now, yeah. mind you, who, who was it? Was it Doug? I think it was Doug. No, who? I don't remember who it was. But someone was saying, well, my chicken's really dry. I'm like, that's because you're overcooking it, man. Right. Yeah. <laughs> no, it was Doug. Yeah, it was Doug. It was Doug. I'm like, I'm like, uh, I'm like, okay, when you learn how to cook, when you really get that down, and if, you, if you're overcooking, get a meat thermometer. Know right. what, like, get it to the point where it, it's cooked through and then stop. Because if, if your chicken's dry and you get frustrated with chicken, it's not because the chicken's dry. It's because you're overcooking it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> And yeah, I wanted to circle back real quick to um, lifestyle change. Um, yes. I, I think it's, I, I want to say it was on an episode of My 600 Pound Life. I love that show. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the people on there said that an addiction to food is the hardest addiction to break. So when you're addicted to gambling, you don't go to the casino. When you're addicted to alcohol, you don't buy alcohol. You're addicted to drugs stay away from the drugs, go to rehab. We literally need food to survive. Right. It's everywhere. Food isn't just something we eat. It's, if you think about it, every single event in life is always about food. Yep. Mm -hmm. Funerals, weddings, birthdays, reunions, cookouts, everything is surrounded around food. You know, what can I bring to the cookout? So because that food is always there, it's such a hard habit to break that emotional bond with it that the whole, you know, eat, uh, calories in versus calories out. Yeah, that's the science behind it, but it all comes down to behavioral change. Mm -hmm. I, I, that's way up John's alley. He always talks, yeah. he literally talks about that constantly, which is like, you can cut almost every other struggle you have. You can't, you can't just stop eating. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's actually, I love the fact that you brought up the whole, I get annoyed with calorie zealots where all they say is calories. And I'm like, yeah. oh, shut the fuck up. Because if it was that simple, like, like I just sit there and go, yeah, eat just carbs and fats and right. be like, oh, yeah, I'm just going to eat ice cream and I'm yeah. going to keep my calorie deficit and my life's going to be great. No. Like, yeah. yeah. Will you lose body fat because you're in a calorie deficit? Yes. Yeah. Will you be literally suffering yeah. as the rest of your body falls apart? Yes. So yeah. if you want to be this, like, oh, it's just calories, <laughs> I'm just like, yeah, that as a scientific perspective is true, but it's like, you are, you are literally cutting out so many other nuances of yeah. satiety and general health. And it's like, oh, you, I understand you, you, you want to just say calories because it's calories and calories. That is the scientific truth. Calorie deficit, yeah. man. <laughs> Come on, calorie deficit, man. Yeah. Th that is true. Yeah. But you know how just ridiculous that sounds to someone who's 480 pounds like just yeah. calorie deficit yeah what does that even mean <laughs> yeah that's like that's like a doctor telling their patient okay go be healthy like yeah, see yeah. You later yeah yeah okay. it's just, yeah that's great all right, billy well you need to you that? need to diet and exercise and uh, all right i'll see you in six weeks I'll see you in six yeah. weeks <laughs> eat less move more yeah yeah it's like okay uh, thank you. Thank you. Eat less of what move more of what? Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, it's uh, like we had, a, uh, I, I, I was uh, one of our clients. I'll, I'll, I'll keep it uh, name free on this one. Um, I was, I want him to learn his macros. I want him to learn this process of what goes into his mouth. And all of a sudden I was like, okay, g give me like, send me over your week of, of how you're eating, what you're doing. And he was averaging now, mind you, he's 480 pounds. He's averaging like 92 grams of protein a day. And I'm like, and he's losing weight. He was, yeah. I'm like, I'm like, we're going to have to talk. We're going to have to, we're going to have yeah. to work on this. And uh, I was just like, I was like, holy balls. <laughs> and working on that. And I'm a huge proponent of finding that balance between telling someone what to do and making them learn what to do. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And uh, cause again, 
I, I get very wonky with nutritionists that just give you a meal plan. And it's like, yeah, it's like, well, that's great and all. And like telling them what to eat every single meal. But it, that's not scalable. That's not, that's not, you can't, what you're going to tell them to eat this big chicken meal every single time, every day for the rest of their lives. Where do they go to the restaurant? What are they going to do? If you don't teach them these foundations on like nutrition, how are you going to create sustainability? Not only that, like what happens when they are no longer working with you and you're not spoon feeding them that meal plan? Yes. You know, I, you, you've, you've literally set them up for failure. For failure. Right. Because they've learned nothing. Right. They learn. There's being the told what to do. The revolving door of, of diet culture continues. Yeah. yeah. I, that, so there's, some, there's some even nutritionists that I, I've, I've had little. It's so weird. Um, I actually had this conversation with my dad yesterday because it's, it's so hard to... <sighs> there are bad doctors, there are bad lawyers, there are bad everything. And like, there are bad yeah. nutrition, there are, there's just bad everything across the board and being able to discern that is such an important skill. Yeah. Because we had uh, one of the guys in the community who's lost over 300 pounds. He's actually about to have his excess skin removal surgeries, which is awesome. Um, the idea that insurance is paying for it is bullshit. Uh, right. But that's a whole other thing. Uh, but he lost 300 pounds in the awful term, naturally, not non-surgical. Um, yeah. And he's like 250 pounds going to see his general doctor. And, he, and his doctor's like, you need to lose another 30 pounds. And the man's lost 300 pounds. Right. So this doctor's not taking into account the probably 30 pounds of excess skin he's got on his body. Yeah. And so he goes, oh, so first off, then he jabs at him about getting gastric. And it's like, the man naturally lost 300 pounds. Why are you, he's 40 pounds with an ideal body weight? What do you, yeah. why? And then the doctor tells him to go to the, his nutritionist, which immediately the nutritionist puts him on a 1200 calorie diet. And I'm just like, and so he's on the community call. And we're talking about this. And I'm like, Hey, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a nutritionist. Be careful. And so like yeah. having that conversation and he, he did it and he started binge eating. Yeah. Because he and went he to a 1200 count and, never and he never had a binge eating problem before. And, uh, and like, and then we, we talked about it, we got him through it and now he's back on path. And it's just like, it's crazy to think there are doctors and nutritionists that give that advice. Yep. And it's just like, so like, what, what, what is your recommendation? Since you've been through it, you're, you're at a 90, 10, you, you sit right down the middle. How do you discern that? Like, and I know it's, it's a super wonky place yeah. because I know we have to be careful on what advice you can legally give, all this kind of stuff. But how do you discern that? Does that make sense? Um, I mean, it, it's tough because, you know, we as professionals, we say, oh, you know, only go to the professionals for advice. But then you have those outliers that right. mm -hmm. are giving bad information. And it's, it's really hard. You know, it, it, there's really no right or wrong way to go about it because at that point, if you go to one doctor and they tell you one thing, you go to another and they tell you something else you as the individual seeking help, who are you supposed to believe? Mm -hmm. You know, how do you figure out which one is right, which one is wrong? I you guess, know, I think so it really- Well, the, the way to kind of convey this maybe a little better, do you have any red flags that you would kind of say, hey, I'd get a second opinion if they said something like this? Does that make sense? Um, not really. I mean, okay. there, there's red flag words, you know, yeah, like right. if, if you, if, if something sounds extremely low calorie, something like 1200 diets for somebody, you know, uh, of that size, that's definitely a red flag. You know, I, yeah. I've done a couple of videos on, you know, 12 and 1500 calorie diets for, you know, grown adults. Mm -hmm. um, you know, no, no, but that's just not sustainable. That's, that's not something that anybody should. And I even had people in the comments, well, why does Dr. Now on my 600 pound life put people on you know, 800 calorie diets. Well, that's like in a, in a medical setting, you know, right. it's, who knows what kind of, you know, lab works are getting done regularly. It's, it's not, okay, here's this meal plan for 1200 calories. See you in six weeks. Go <laughs> do it on your own. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. Hmm. Yeah. Cause I, I always, that, and that's, I, that question is, is, is such a tough question to even answer. I'll be honest. Like it, cause it is such a wonky place and it's like uh, just, it's it's disheartening to me and it's it's tough where it's like you would think that every single medical professional would have the same perspective and kind of but they don't like and and that's always a tough part to kind of and that's what i think is so important with what we do is trying to sift through it a little bit give you some context so that you can learn for yourself on a basic level that 
you're in control. Like you can, you can learn these habits of like yeah. eating on a higher protein diet, working on lifestyle change, creating a better relationship with food, moving your body more to mm-hmm. what you enjoy. These are things that when you hear them, they work no matter what, and they build sustainability. Is, is one, such- one piece of advice I, I tend to give pretty regularly is, so a lot of people don't realize that doctors, they get very, very little nutrition education. Yep. Very, very, very little. little. David like, actually says that a lot on here. That, yeah. that in eight years of schooling, they, they got three sat hours in one class where they learned what the macros were. Yep. You know, and and that's the extent of their nutrition education. And so I always recommend, especially now that uh, registered dietitians, they're starting to become more prevalent in the insurance system, mm-hmm. uh, especially for obesity, weight management, diabetes. Um, so you really need to go to a professional that's going to help you specifically for what you're looking for. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, you walk into the doctor's office, he's going to tell you, oh, you need to lose some weight. Okay, well, how do I do that? And if you ask for a referral, insist, insist on getting a referral to a registered dietitian, that will benefit you tremendously. I, I completely agree. Like that, that, that's, that's a huge one that I always, I kind of, it's a tough one to talk about, but doctors just don't, they don't have the time. Like they're doing, so, yeah. they're, they're working on so many different things from they're seeking, they're trying to figure out if you have cancer, they're trying to figure out if you have all this kind of stuff to kind of keep yeah. you in it. So the idea of being able to educate you on nutrition, they're just going to tell you, guess what? You're overweight. You're, you're, you're pre-diabetic. You need to lose weight. And that's all they yeah. can tell you. Cause they're, they're, they're in the office with you for 15 minutes and I right. don't blame yeah. them like that. They don't have the time. And the medical system, I think is, it's extremely flawed uh, for, for example. So I'm a registered dietitian and a licensed nutritionist in the state of Florida. Mm-hmm. If somebody came to me with a medical condition and I wanted to treat their medical condition with diet, that's called medical nutrition therapy. Yep. In order to legally do medical nutrition therapy with them, I have to get approval from their treating physician. Oh my gosh. So I have to get approval from a doctor to do my job. That's and crazy. that really comes down to the whole, you know, God complex of doctors. They, yep. especially like now chiropractors, they're really getting into nutrition. Yep. And a really? lot of them, yep. re- yeah, they really promote keto and intermittent fasting are the mm-hmm. two biggest things that a lot of chiropractors are are pushing. Mm-hmm. Why is that? Uh, I mean, I have no idea. Yeah, it's, it's, well, I'm, I'm both... going in there to get my back cracked. I don't know. What, what are you telling me to go? <laughs> yeah, because it makes money. A lot of, a lot of them, they'll, they'll sell supplements on the side, mm-hmm. Interesting. Uh, you know, exogenous ketones, fat burners, like it's, Ooh. it's crazy. What's uh? so what's your opinion on exogenous ketones? I mean, I don't personally have any experience with them. I've never okay. tried them. Um, See, I find know, I them think... unique. Like there's, again, it doesn't stop like calorie deficit, macro control. I think there is a place for them because I've taken exogenous ketones in the past and it, it is fascinating. The, the satiety you get from when you take them, um, the, 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 the flowed energy I got from now, it could be 20% the, of the, uh, placebo, placebo effect. Yeah. Yeah. But like, but I, I, I'm pretty intuitive with my body with like feel I, it was super interesting. I'll admit it was super interesting taking exogenous ketone, just the feeling of energy and fullness you got. It was, it was, that doesn't take and, away from the rest. But it was interesting. Patient <laughs> and the basics figured out. Mm-hmm. Don't worry about exogenous ketones. Yep. You know, and and the marketing of these things I've seen is, you know, oh, take these in the morning and you'll lose twenty pounds in a month. And I'm like, okay, well, there's a whole lot of other variables a whole lot of stuff. Looking at. Yep. Yep. No, I completely agree. So I have a question for you. Um, like what? what are the first few pieces of advice that you give a client who comes to you and, you know, they say, listen, I'm 150, 200 pounds overweight. You know, I think I'm addicted to carbs. I'm addicted to sugar. What are some of the first steps that you take in order to help correct what they're doing right now? So if, if I don't think it's going to have a negative mental impact on them, I immediately have them start tracking their calories. Okay. Just because that creates that awareness there's I a agree. lot of people that they come to me. The first thing out of their mouth is I only eat 1500 calories a day and I'm putting on weight. 
but are you only eating 1500 calories? Like let's, right. let's do a two week baseline and let me see exactly what you're eating. And, and you're telling me to weigh out their out food 10, and everything too. Or are you like, how, how yeah, it, detailed do you go? I give them as, as much as they can handle. Okay. So yeah. I tell them that weighing out your food is obviously going to be the most accurate, but if you don't feel comfortable doing that, we'll just start small I'm all about small goals. Yep. So yes, build, build that motivation, build that confidence. Wow. I did this. I lost a pound this week. Let's, let's shoot for two, as opposed to, I'm going to start working with you. You're going to lose a hundred pounds. Right. Like, okay. Yeah. That's, that, that's a great end game to have, but let's focus on one pound first, yep. you know, build that confidence, build that momentum and just kind of ride that wave. Right. So I, I think creating that awareness goes a long way. You know, most people just don't know how much they're eating. I, right. I, I, absolutely. I, I'm a huge proponent. If anybody, it's like, first thing you do, track your calories for a week. Just yep. every, everything that goes in your mouth, put it in my fitness pal. Just yep. see how many calories you're actually eating in a day and it'll blow your fucking mind. And you're like, yep. it, it's like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm 410 pounds and I don't know why I'm not losing weight. Well, shit, I just ate 6,000 calories a day. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I may, I may, I may understand now. And all of a sudden they cut down to say, Oh, I did 1800 and I'm, I'm just so hungry. And yeah. then it's like, okay, well, how much protein out of the 1800 was your, were you at? And it's like, yeah. oh, you only got 60 grams of protein in. Do you see the, yeah. and now I'm not saying do 1800, but I'm just saying that that whole idea out, like right. you, when you cut down it's like, okay, now let's work on satiety. That's great. High protein, build up, like make your meals look bigger with lower calories, all this kind of stuff. Um, but it is breaking down the mysticism of calories to it, the first step. I think it's such a great place to be because it's like, oh, I just ate 7,000 calories today. Okay. That, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I've had clients come to me and they tell me I drink 10 Cokes a day and I'm like, okay, well, I'm not going to cut out Cokes completely. Let's, let's drop down to five. You know, you don't, tra you, you, you do, you have, do you keep them the sugar? Or do you just transition to diet Coke? Um, eventually, I mean, if they can, if they can stomach it, but you know, there's, there's people that just, they love yeah. the regular Coke, you yeah. know? And I think that just, just going from 10 Cokes a day to five is going to have a drastic impact. Yeah. Yeah. On so 500 that, calories a day. Pounds, yeah. Is know? that 500 calories a day ish? Uh, well, I think uh, a regular 110? Coke is 110. Is it 110? I thought it was like 180 the yeah, 180 i think it's 180 180 yeah, so yeah, yeah you're talking fuck yeah <laughs> i mean 10 cokes that's that's a ton of calories for you know very little actual nutrition how uh, oh john you go no i was just gonna say i don't think the i do not think the normal human being realizes how many calories they take in just from beverages mm -hmm. you know yeah. everyone Liquid always says is wild. yeah everyone's always like oh yeah you know I'm, I'm just really a water drinker you know sometimes i really you know i like a diet coke every now and again or i like a regular coke every now and again and then you realize you know if you really like you said track everything in you're probably having and not even realizing 300 400 calories just in beverages you know yeah. that doesn't mean on a friday night when you go out to drink all of a sudden on a friday night alcohol doesn't count yeah no, we don't we you know it's like that that those calories not nah, they they don't mean it. Even thing. from juice, something like orange juice, right. you know, they're like, yeah. oh, I just drink juice. It's healthy. You know, well, it's got calories too, you know? Yeah. It, apple it juice, orange juice, it's so much sugar. So much. Yeah. Sugar. yeah. Well, yeah. it's apples. Yeah. But how much added sugar do they have to that right. apple? Yeah. How about yeah. you just eat an apple instead? Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, why doesn't the apple taste like the apple juice? Because <laughs> of the added <laughs> sugar. <laughs> now, how has your experience been? Because I'm. I, this is going to be a unique question. Coming from a military background where it's fuck you do it to, yeah. and, and, and there's an, there is a group that needs to hear that the David Goggins, fuck you do it to the, I'm here for positive affirmation, man. You got this. How do you balance that? Do you play that game? Like, like, have you had clients where sometimes we're like, I just can't just, just do it. Like, how does that uh yeah, it's it's definitely uh, kind of played to your audience. Um, mm -hmm. Right. You know, it, it some of them are handled with kids kid gloves. Some of them need that you know drill instructor. So it, it's <laughs> it, it's definitely a fine line. It depends on the individual. Yeah, you got I, it's I, all individual. I've had them on, on on both sides. Have you had have you had some where you're like, I just really want a donut today? It's just, no, you did this and this and this yesterday. <laughs> you need to learn some self discipline. No. Yeah, and you know it starts off 
okay, you want a donut, honor that craving, you know, and, and it's, it's about kind of learning the difference between hunger and a craving. Yes. Yep. You know, it, are you hungry or are you having a craving? You know, if you're not going to sit there and eat a whole box of donuts and you can honor that craving as long as it fits into your calories, your macros, you know, whatever. But when you're doing it every day, five times a day, then the drill instructor comes out, you know, it's <laughs> <laughs> that, that was, it's like, I always talk about, um, so like you, you have, you have shit and sugar where there are people out there that have gotten shit their whole lives. You're a loser. You're a loser. You're never amount to anything, blah, 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 blah. And they, they just need some sugar in their life to yeah. like positive affirm them to like, holy shit, I can do this. And then you have the sugar people like myself who I was given sugar, sunshine, and rainbows every fucking day for like, Hey, you can, you can do whatever you want, Billy. Like, great. You, I, we're here for you. And I needed a little bit of stop being a little baby, like <laughs> discipline and accountability and doing the right thing is in your control. And it's like, some people need that positive affirmation. It goes a long way. And some people yeah. just need a little like, no, you can say no. It's crazy. Yeah. Like, no. <laughs> yeah. That's always a fun one. Well, this has been a great conversation, man. I, yeah. I, it's, it's been across the board. Um, nutrition, your story is fascinating in and of itself. I'm sure you got incredible stories and, and everything for the sacrifices you've been through. Um, and so what's the next step where, so you, you started this business and you, you, you're a couple of years into it, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, how, where, where are you trying to take it? Are you happy with where you're at? Like, are you trying to scale into something bigger with more, with more nutritionists than what you're just doing currently? What's like your kind of vision? Um, so I, I'm sure TikTok switched right, things up a little bit. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> you know, and it, it really changed my whole mindset of, you know, I, I love the, I've, I feel like the first time in my life I'm, I'm helping people. Like nice. I'm creating change in people's lives. Right. And that's why I love my one-on-one -on -one nutrition coaching, but like seeing these comments and reading the DMS from, you know, TikTok, Instagram, like my videos seem to help people on a much larger scale. Yes. And most people like they really, it really seems to resonate with them that holy shit, I didn't know that, you know, losing weight could be just a matter of meal prepping the foods that I enjoy. You know, mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be, you know, boiled chicken, brown rice and broccoli every single day, three times a day, you know, eating these foods. And so I'm really trying to find a way to kind of, I mean, I, you know, I've got bills just like everybody else. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to find a way to monetize Absolutely. my social media platform and, you know, kind of have that financial freedom to continue putting all of my energy into creating content to help people on a much larger scale. Uh, just because my nutrition coaching, it takes up so much of my time. Yeah. So my I business, agree. my business uh, kind of model is they have 24 seven access to me. Yep. They, I give them my We're cell the phone way. number yeah. and you know, I'm constantly on the phone with my, with my clients, you know, middle of my workout, middle of dinner, middle of the night, like just answering questions. 3 a.m. Just... I want ice cream. Can I have ice yeah. cream? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I'm trying to find a way to kind of transition over to uh, just doing the whole social media thing. And um, So, Zach, I like to end the podcast. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for coming on. I want to thank you for, you know, sharing your story. Um, again, I want to thank you for your service because that's just totally awesome and just yeah. Appreciate it. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so we like to end the episode by asking the guest a series of questions. Um, so I want the first question I want to know is three pieces of advice from a nutrition standpoint on, you know, for people that are just kind of starting to change their life or they're on the cusp of wanting to change their life. You know, what are three um, solid pieces? So the biggest thing that, that I always try to coach and promote is try not to fixate too much on the end game, you know, start with those small goals and shoot for those. So long-term success is built on those, those small goals, you know, achieving those small goals. Um, and I, I really think that that goes a long way in building a sustainable lifestyle. You know, it's, when we, when we decide to diet and lose weight or, you know, pursue uh, some sort of fitness goal, we tell ourselves, I'm only going to eat this much. I'm going to cut out this food. I'm never going to eat, you know, fast food. I'm going to go to the gym seven times a day. 
And when we fall short just once or twice, it really, it's, it's debilitating. We feel mm-hmm. like a failure. We feel guilty. Right. And it, it just creates that negative headspace to where we want to give up, you know? So setting those small goals, I think is really the first step towards achieving that long-term goal. Absolutely. Um, where do you see yourself in the next, you know, five years down the road? Um, I don't know. I, I honestly, I would really like to, uh, one of the things I have in the works is, uh, starting a YouTube channel. Ooh. Um, just because I feel like I'm very limited on TikTok, Um, yep. they, you know, recently increased the, the watch minutes. time or the video time to three minutes. But, um, a lot of these videos that I do, I could go so much more in depth, you know, it right. almost leaves the, my audience wanting for more, um, you know, and they'll take that into the comment section, but there's only so much I can, you know, relay a, as a message in, in the comments. So I think uh, there's, there's a definitely a place for uh, a YouTube in my future. Nice. Um, so that's something I, w- I would like to achieve. Very dope. Very dope. Uh, final question. How, as a society, guys like, you know, you, me, David, in this sphere, how can we kind of push a better agenda when it comes to diet culture? Again, it comes down to finding something that's sustainable for you. Right. You know, it's like you touched on in the beginning of the, the podcast is like the word diet. It's 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 almost like a, a, a negative word mm-hmm. because it it portrays something that's temporary sacrifice you know, and temporary yeah. yeah you know stop looking at it as something that has a beginning and an end and just decide that you know i want to change my life i want to be healthier don't look at it as something temporary look at it as this is the change i'm going to make in my life i'm going to take control of my life i'm going to take accountability and just kind of go that mental route instead absolutely Zach, where can we find you? Uh, give me all your social media handles. Uh, TikTok and Instagram at Zach Cohen. Excellent. Simple man. and easy. Yeah. Super yeah. easy. Super easy. Um, now, if you could give me your social security number in the bank account info. I was, I was gonna. I was gonna go. Uh, I was going. There's three three questions. Uh, social security number. Uh, <laughs> man it was a it was an one last last question pleasure to oh go ahead i got one last question for you who are your go-to like inspirations. uh inspirations like educators um when you're trying to get your stuff who do you go to um i i really like um i don't know if you guys know food science babe food um, science babe. she yeah food science babe so she is a food scientist um she's really big on instagram and facebook Okay. Um, she recently started uh, TikTok as well. Her videos are absolutely amazing. She touches on a lot of misinformation in the in the food industry. Um, she touches on a lot of like food additives, preservatives, uh, Red Forty, you know, GMOs, okay. pesticides, all this stuff. Her her videos are absolutely amazing. They're extremely educational. Um, it's really interesting to get the perspective of somebody who actually does this as a job all right what was it again food food babe food food science babe no no no. don't don't confuse her with food babe okay so food science babe food babe yeah well that's that's a whole different conversation (laughs) oh gosh she 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 is the misinformation monster food babe yeah so she really perpetuates the whole misinformation food phobia fear mongering so uh, don't quote me, but I, I assume that maybe food science, babe, it was like a play on words. As a play on too, offers. Right? Yeah, yeah, um, so. I'm on food, babe, right now. She's got 700,000 followers on Instagram. Yeah, huge following. Huge wow, following. that's crazy. What and then uh, I really like uh, uh, Dr. Lane Norton. Love okay. his stuff. Yeah. Very dope. Hmm. Interesting. Very Perfect. Dope. I was. I was... We'll, we'll, we'll link all, all those accounts and obviously your yeah, account we'll in, the, in the description and everything like that. But again, Zach, thank you very much for taking some time out, you know, being on the podcast and thanks for taking the plunge and even trying to do a podcast. Yeah, uh, hopefully we didn't me. ruin your experience. Yeah. Ho- yeah. Hopefully you no, had a good time. Um, yeah. And yeah, man, thank you for just sharing some knowledge today. I really appreciate it, dude. Yeah. I appreciate you guys having me. It was fun. Absolutely. All right, guys. 
We want to thank you for listening to today's podcast. If you would like to support the podcast, you go to redcon1.com and use promo code T20JARPS. That's promo code T20JARPS for 20% off your whole order. If you'd like to be a part of the ALG community call, it goes down each and every single Wednesday night at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 5.30 Pacific, and it is, as always, absolutely positively free. You go to accountablelifegroup.com, click the events tab, and it'll take you right in through Zoom. If you're interested in ALG coaching, go to algcoaching.com. We have we offer group and one-on-one -on -one coaching. David, I believe that is all. Is there anything else that you would like to say before we wrap this puppy up toodles stay beautiful stay sexy stay accountable until next time